Um, so just painting big paintings just to paint them, or painting paintings just to paint them, was awesome for learning and for education and for growing. And um, and I still have more learning and growing to do, no doubt about it, as a painter. Um, but I've slowed down that practice of just painting to paint. And a lot of what I do now, I want to have a home, right? I want to have an intention. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I meet a painter here in town who does portraits, does realistic paintings, but the funny thing is, is they actually started out wanting to be an illustrator, so much so that they were pitching cartoons while they were interning at The New Yorker and also did a few illustrated children's books. But what happened was, is through both of those things, they discovered what they really wanted to do was paint for the sake of painting and just to paint realistic things. It's a great story that they tell. So here's the interview starting right now. I'm Jesse Mangerson. Um, I am a uh, fine art painter and um, a teacher um, of, uh, of fine art painting. And you um, are located right here in Madison, correct? Yeah, I live here in Madison, um, just on the west side. Um, I teach for uh, a school in San Francisco, um, the Academy of Art University. I oh. help to run their online program for the, the, the uh, Masters in Fine Art Painting. Um, and then I also uh, run workshops through Monroe Street Arts. Um, and uh, lately I've been taking out a lot of commission paintings more so than painting um, for myself. So. Well, and how did, how, okay, first of all, how are you doing the one that's in San Francisco? How are you teaching those classes? Yeah, so um, we lived in San Francisco before we moved to Madison. Um, oh, geez, I guess it's almost 14 years ago now. Yeah. Uh, and when we were living out there, I was uh, teaching on site uh, at the academy. And uh, also, they would give me an online class or two um, each semester. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when we decided we wanted to leave the city, um, I asked them if they could support me full time, um, you know, teaching online remotely and they agreed. And I've been doing that ever since, um, from this space here, which is my, my new sort of basement studio that I built out. And you're saying that was even like 12 years ago when you were at, no later than 12 years ago that you wanted to do that. Correct. Well, it, yeah, we moved, we moved here in 2010. Well, cause that's not really a 12 years ago, teaching online seems like a huge deal rather whereas right now everybody, everybody's doing it you know yeah the 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 online program there started in 2001 okay um and so it's been you know building and we've been writing and rewriting classes for you know 23 years at this point oh wow that's pretty um, amazing so it's, yeah it's very well established um and uh it's a convenient way to both learn and teach as as far as i'm concerned you know? okay and when did you get started as an artist like when did you actually start painting and, and working on your style of work? Yeah. So, well, in the, uh, in the nineties, I went to undergraduate school up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. at UW Eau Claire, um, and studied illustration, uh, up there, um, aspired to be an illustrator, um, did a bunch of, uh, sort of imaginative illustration work, um, went out to New York and interned at the New Yorker, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, spent some time there. And so that was sort of the beginning of my, uh, I guess, formal studies as, uh, as an artist. Um, and then uh, my wife and I uh, got married and headed out to, um, to Colorado, lived in Boulder for about five years um, and uh, did work there. Not, not as much as I probably wish I had in hindsight uh, after leaving New York city, um, did a book, um, did some illustration for, a, you know, a weekly magazine in, um, in Oregon. Uh, you know, there's some stuff like that. Uh, but then ended up going to San Francisco for graduate school. And um, that was where I, I got a little bit more serious about it all. Um, you know, that was in 2005 um, and studied um, uh, illustration uh, and fine art painting uh, out there. And um, yeah, and that's that's sort of when I, I, I started to paint uh, with more sort of referenced intention and realism. OK. Um, where I picked up more oil painting, um, you know. Prior to that, I was mostly acrylics and watercolor and a lot of um, a lot of work from the imagination. 
Um, but mm. then after my time in grad school, I leaned more into direct observational work, um, specifically with oils, um, just as a form of study to get to know the world around me better in paint. You know? Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, from there, it, it sort of grew into what I do now. Um, although I was doing illustration work, um, especially in the, the graduate uh, illustration program that I was in, um, I really kind of abandoned that to a degree and focused on, on you know, finer painting. Why did you abandon it? Um, I wasn't fulfilled by it. It wasn't enjoyable to me anymore. Really? There was more of a burden to making the work than than I wanted. And, huh. you know, whereas sitting down and just painting something to paint it, that act of painting was really what I was seeking at the time. Um, and that experience of just painting from direct observation was the fulfilling element that uh, all of the narrative elements and all of the sort of planning and the design elements were sort of getting in the way of, for me personally at the time. Um, and, you know, since then that, you know, there's been a balance that's been struck between those two sort of different departures in my mind. Um, but I still lean more towards that simplicity of, you know, either direct observational painting or uh, painting from from reference. Yeah, it, it's funny because most people have told me that story, but in the opposite direction. It's, yeah, interesting. Yeah, most people are like, you know, I I wanted to make stuff up or there were things. Yeah, it, it seems weird that you were like, I didn't like making stuff up. I, I enjoyed the process of real. It, it sounded like you were saying you enjoyed the fact that you could do the process and not have to go, what does this have to be? Am I correct in thinking that? Um, very much so. And, and there's a, there's a burden in telling a story to a degree, right? And, and, uh -huh. and there's so many different points in the arc of a narrative that you can choose to tell choosing that, that correct point is, is a real challenge. And again, at the time I, I sort of was done doing that. Um, mm -hmm. I was over that idea and wanted just that, it, I, I was almost seeking sort of that meditative process of the, I found in clay when I was an undergrad, right? Um, okay. You know, throwing pots off the wheel was this sort of meditative experience, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was seeking that in painting and I found it by abandoning the narrative um, that, you know, illustration sort of demanded and um, still, you know, utilizing those fundamental aspects of, um, you know, of, of design principles um, uh, but letting go of a lot, you know, caring a little mm -hmm. bit less about what it was supposed to be in terms of telling somebody what they're looking at and just painting what I thought was beautiful, just painting something that I, that I was interested in, I was attracted to, um, which took a while to figure out what that was, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't, that wasn't straightforward. Well, and how do you... How do you choose a subject then? I guess that to me is if you're painting a realistic thing, then you also have to find that realism to paint. Yeah. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So how do you how do you actually seek out what you do or does it capture you or both, I suppose? Yeah. How does that come about? Well, in some experiences I've had, um, you know, a subject matter has found me. Okay. Um, and I'll get to that in just a second. But what I think is more important to remember about the practice of direct observational painting or the practice of painting in general is that it doesn't matter what you paint, right? As long as you're painting. Mm -hmm. If you find it interesting as a subject matter in advance of starting the painting, well, that's maybe a bonus. But what I find is that when I start painting is when I really begin to fall in love with the subject matter, right? Um, you know, like, something as simple as a wine bottle. If I'm going to sit down and paint a wine bottle just for study, right? Right. Um, wine bottle is a wine bottle. You see plenty of wine bottles. Yeah. But once you start to look at that wine bottle and you see it for its properties that define it as an image um, that are really abstract properties of shape, value, and color. And if you think about it in those terms, then that's where sort of the beauty of the subject matter emerges. Mm -hmm. But in many ways that that happens in the painting practice. Of course, you can be walking down the street and see a spectacular view of a landscape and just be taken by it. And, you know, probably aren't gonna paint it. Maybe you'll sh you shoot a photograph of it, but it's that moment of realization that sometimes occurs when you're just sort of serendipitously, serendipitously existing. But then there's also that 
that time where you get to know the subject matter. That could be a mundane subject matter, like a glass bottle. Um, but um, other experiences that I've had, you know, for example, when I was in San Francisco, living in San Francisco, I wanted to paint the cityscape. Mm -hmm. uh, I was intrigued by the city, beautiful place, vistas overlooking buildings, you know, the atmosphere and the light there is just spectacular, but there's cars everywhere. Yeah. And I didn't want, I didn't want to paint cars. I really yeah. didn't. Right. And so I was walking, I used to walk a lot at night in San Francisco and with my camera and my tripod and shoot night references. And I came up the hill on Hyde Street and just sort of glanced up, I think it was Washington. And there was this, this Volkswagen bug sitting there. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I'm gonna shoot that, right? And so I photographed that and just fell in love with that particular image. Stood there with, you know, with the vehicle for a while, walked around and all this stuff. The next day I'm gonna go, I'm gonna walk down there in the daytime and see what's going on, right? And so I went back to that same, same spot in the daytime and that vehicle was still there. So I yeah. shot it in the daytime. Right. And so I painted both of those paintings and realized that my entrance point into painting the cityscape was actually to address the specific thing that I didn't want to paint and learn to paint it. And sort to, of to, to a degree, take take hold of the thing that I was detesting the idea of painting, mm -hmm. find beauty in it. And I and that just sparked this this real long series of painting these vintage Volkswagen cars in the city. Yeah. Um, to the point where I would be walking around and just find one. I wouldn't be looking for one. And it was like, all of a sudden I'd, I'd, I'd come upon him like, oh, oh, there you are. <laughs> and then, you know, I'd spend half an hour, 45 minutes shooting a bunch of references of it. Maybe it would become a painting, maybe it wouldn't. Um, you know, the reference, the number of references, the number of paintings, it, it favors, you know, references. There's hundreds and hundreds of them that didn't get painted. Right. And I was going to say, the second you were telling that story, I'm like, wait, the first thing you did was you found a car and that wasn't what, you know, you were trying not to. But right. also, so when you did find it and you also went there twice, you said, how did you, how do you set up? Did you use the photo as a reference? Are you going back to the area and setting up and painting it? Like what's the process for when you do a project yeah. like that? I didn't paint those from direct observation. Those okay. were driven by photo references. So I'd have my DSLR camera with me and I would shoot a, a, as many references as possible hmm. from many different directions. Um, if I, if I found one and I thought it was in a good spot, I would think, I would think about the light that might be earlier in the day or later in the day or what what might this look like at night and i would go back there okay um i i painted on location in the city you know uh plein air in the city but uh it didn't become a regular practice for me um so i was doing most of that work from photo references okay um but you know to me plein air painting you know direct observational painting on location is more of a study uh, opportunity than it is, uh, you know, a, a, a larger finished work opportunity. Although returning multiple times, I think is fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I use those more as sort of just study of, of, you know, shape, value, color, light, and, um, and think whether that could become something that is, that's, you know, maybe, uh, more engaging and more intriguing if I were to spend more time on it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll see people doing that sometimes, especially I live downtown here in Madison and I'll go to the union and I'll see people set up with their, you know, with their canvas and painting outside and stuff. And I'm like, oh, how neat. But the more I think about it, I'm like, oh, that's got to be a super hassle, <laughs> you know, really bringing all your stuff there and setting up and then people just watching you, especially in a busy area like that. I don't know. For me personally, I would be a bit intimidated. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I've got this great setup for plein air painting. It's just this little push out box with an easel. Um, and I, you know, keep my paints in a Ziploc bag and I carry paper mm. towels and I've got it all in a backpack. And so I'll throw that on my back and go out to paint. And um, it's pretty quick. I can be set up and painting probably in you know, 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Um, and then the teardown is just as easy. Uh, but obviously not washing brushes or cleaning up much on location. I wrap my brushes in paper towel, throw them in my bag and take care of them back at the studio, you know? Okay. Um, 
Now, but yeah, the people, the people uh, that that come up yes. to you, and, you know, and, and look over your shoulder and um, comment on on what it is that you're painting can be a distraction. Yeah. If you've done it long enough, if you do it enough times, you kind of get used to it, you know, and you know what to say to to, you know, answer their questions, but not necessarily engage them in a conversation because you've got like two and a half hours to right. capture the, the image before the lights changing. Right. And yeah. so, um, you know, location painting uh, around Madison, you can find a spot where you can hide and not, <laughs> and not really yes. see very many people and have some cool things to paint. True. Um, but, uh, like I taught a, a location landscape painting, uh, semester study abroad program in Florence, um, a number of years ago. But when we're you know, so when we we're in Florence painting, that was a little bit more of a challenge to find a spot that is out of the way or a spot where where you wouldn't get interrupted too many times. Um, you know, mm. if there's a spot that's you know the sidewalks there are real narrow, and so if you're setting up on a sidewalk, you've got to be sure that you're not blocking a doorway or that you're not going to block walkways or whatever, or they're not going to get hit, hit by a car when you're coming <laughs> back. But, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and it's the and that's exactly it. I I meant people coming by and wanting to talk, and then people right. also going, "This is in not going like, oh, these people are annoying me. I'm trying to paint." It's like, no, you could accidentally get into a conversation, an interesting conversation. Then it's like, oh, I came here to paint. I didn't get anything done. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now speaking like of you, getting, you run into a friend at the gym. And yeah, you got an hour to work out. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden, twenty minutes later, you're like, I should probably get on the. Mill. That's okay. a great point. <laughs> I like that analogy. Yeah. 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 Now, speaking of time to get things done, now let's go back to this uh, teaching classes thing, both online and in person. So, yeah. uh, how do you, first of all, how do you, uh, when you're not doing it for the school, I know you've done personal classes, you've also taught classes at some of the local centers here and things like that. How do you find people when you're setting up? your own art classes, when you're doing your own painting classes? How do you find people to, uh, for those sort of classes? Yeah, in the past, I've been approached by people um, to do uh, like private lessons. So um, for about a year, I was uh, doing a, a private lesson with with this this one guy who's a great, great person. Um, I would drive out to his house about you know half an hour away, spend three hours painting, clean up, drive home you know mm -hmm. um uh, he found me which was great um uh with regards to the monroe street arts it was a similar kind of thing um someone i had met elsewhere had been trying to figure out how i could help to hold you know art classes for uh you know her group of of painters that she has has been painting with for a long time um and Incidentally, she actually approached approached Monroe Street Arts and said, "Hey, you should talk to this guy, oh, Jesse, okay. and have him um, come do workshops there." So that kind of came through um, somebody that already knew. Now, with regards to Monroe Street Arts, which is great, they, they're they're actually, I mean, they're awesome. A bunch mm -hmm. of great people run that organization, um, geared a lot towards children, um, in in what they've done in the past. But you know, I think collectively we're trying to sort of open the door to adult uh, art education there. Um, and um, and so what they do is they promote um, to their, uh, you know, client list, their uh, their supporters, um, what classes are available. I'm, in, I'm included in that. And so, um, you know, sometimes the classes run if they fill, sometimes they don't. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of, I guess, Monroe Street Arts puts the the offer out there i i push it out through social media i push it out through word of mouth those types of things um and uh yeah when the classes run we have a we have a lot of fun okay and then you know, when you teach the online classes i guess what i'd like to know it's one thing to be in front of people and show them like okay here's what we're going to be doing here look at this but how do you structure a a online course how do you do you have multiple camera setups? Like what, what is your setup for actually teaching these when you're doing them online, whether it be for personal or for schools, how are you doing this? Yeah. Well, I don't do online teaching uh, outside of the school. 
right? I, okay. I, I strictly do that for the school. Gotcha. Um, if, if I have a choice for teaching, I'm teaching in person, um, you know, in terms of, you know, any classes that aren't through my, my employment with the university. Um, the classes that I teach for the school are all asynchronous, which means that um, very little happens in real time. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so it, which is one of the conveniences of it, right? Mm -hmm. now, there are a lot of art schools right now that are doing more real time things. Um, and actually through the pandemic, uh, we switched to a sort of a, a dual uh, sort of platform where there was some Zoom classes and there were some of the traditional asynchronous classes. Um, and both can work, it seems, but mm -hmm. uh, the way that we do it or have done it for the past 20 plus years is asynchronously. And we write courses. And so um, there's like 15 weeks to a semester. And so each week has um, lectures, written lectures, um, you know, 15 pages of written lectures embedded with, uh, you know, uh, images, step by step, um, uh, sort of written content, um, examples. Uh, but then we also, uh, when I've written classes in the past, I think I've written eight classes maybe now at this point. Um, I'll go out to San Francisco and I will film video demos um, for the exercises and the assignments. Um, and so that's where the sort of you know, the demo comes from, right? Uh, the stuff that you want to see if you're studying art. How is that person painting it? Um, mm. But the beauty is, it's not just if, if I write the class, it's not just me. Um, we'll bring in uh, you know, a bunch of other instructors to diversify um, the approach of whatever class it might be. Um, yeah, and then so so that all exists and a student will watch that. And then on a week by week basis, um, they'll follow a description of the assignments or exercises, upload them into the online system. And then I go in and add an uh, MP3 audio critique. Okay. And then I mark up their image. So it's um, you know, suggestions on what to what to fix, what to do, whatever. That makes so much more sense. Okay. <laughs> because yeah. of the way, that's why I was like, this school has been doing this for over 12 years because of the pandemic. My mind instantly went to like, you were doing live streaming and going, hello class, I'm your virtual teacher for today. And no, it's, you're right. That's, I forgot. That is the way that online college courses were, is it was like, there's a, not a message board, but kind of like a instructional lesson board where you had modules and it's like, get yeah. through this, send your yeah. work. Yeah. Duh. Yeah. Now that you, as you were saying that, I'm like, oh yeah, that was yeah. online teaching for a very long time. I and forgot it works about and that. It still works. Yeah. Right? So, Zoom, you know, 15 years ago, Zoom didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we had some other like meeting platforms that were, you had to call in on a telephone and, you know, audio wasn't a thing. It was all video here and then we'd be on our phones. Right. Yeah. Like the um, teleseminars. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but it, it works. Mm -hmm. it, it really like, I'm still, so like, I guess I'm, I shouldn't be surprised by it anymore. I'm not surprised by it, but I'm always sort of um, really pleased when, when I, when I see students just succeed with it it works for people. And that's, that to me is a kind of a neat thing because you can be anywhere in the world um, and, and study at a high level, right? Mm -hmm. Be up in the middle of the woods in Wisconsin where, mm -hmm. where there's nobody else for 10 miles and, you know, still be studying painting. Yeah. And the problem used to be whether or not you had an internet connection up there. And now that's not as much of a problem either. You can even have just a mobile data connection or a right. Wi-Fi hotspot yeah. or yeah. satellite. Yeah. 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 So that's that barrier has also been gotten rid of. Um, yeah. Now, I also wanted to ask you about, and you mentioned it very briefly, but you did do a couple of illustrated children's books in the past. I did, yeah. I, I worked uh, sort of uh, collaboratively on uh, an illustrated children's book with um, three other uh, illustrators. Um, yeah, it's called Four is a Little, Four is a Lot. And that was back when I was in San Francisco. Okay. Um, that was an interesting experience. Um, you know, uh, the author's brother spearheaded the project. So it wasn't through a major publishing house, but it was fun because I got to collaborate with three other, you know, very talented illustrators who all have gone on to do cool things. Um, actually, a lot of them uh, ended up in design for film and animation 
mm-hmm. um, after that uh, after that book came out. Um, and then prior to that, I did a book in um, How to Show George the Door in 2004. Ben Cohen of Ben and Jerry's and uh, Jason Salzman of what was then called Cause Communications had put out this this campaign book of um, ways that you uh, can sort of get out the vote to try to get oh. George W. Bush out of office oh. in 2004. Okay. And so we were living in Boulder and cost communications was out of Denver. And I had a friend who was working for Jason um, and um, they brought me in on the project and it wasn't a big project. I contributed maybe you know, six or eight illustrations to the book, but they had good ideas. You know, they were like, you know, all these different ways you, you could just, you know, convince people to not vote for George Bush. It was a fun book. It was a fun project. Yeah. Didn't work, unfortunately. <laughs> right. But, you know, it's not a politics podcast. So. Yeah. yeah. How yeah. did you, what was the method you used for making the illustrations for these books? Were you painting them? Were you uh, yeah. drawing them with marker, pencil? How were you doing it? These are all watercolor illustrations. Oh, they were. Okay. Stylized figures. Um, you know, uh, again, these are, uh, well, let's see, the the campaign book, uh, the political book was shortly after I was illustrating or sort of in that time that I was still aspiring to be an illustrator. And so I had honed my stylistic or my stylized characters. Um, I had, I had pitched these same sort of the same look of these illustrations I ended up doing to the book or for the book um, to uh, the cartoons editors at the New Yorker when I was out there who um, w- was really gracious in, in giving me feedback. But incidentally, I, I left shortly after I had pitched the cartoons. And so I never really connected with them um, on doing more of those. And it was 2001. So email was one of those things that was sort of like kind of a thing. Right. It'll kind never stick around. Thing. You know, it's like, well, I could email the guy and see, you know, if, if that were the case now, you know, the, the, the connection would be, you know, a little bit easier to make, but um, yeah, anyway, so, that look to um, to sort of the stylized figures I was making grew from uh, pitching cartoons to the New Yorker and then became sort of an illustrative approach to, to, uh, you know, figures for um, a couple different things. And then uh, when I did the four is little four is a lot book, um, I used that same approach. Um, And I think mainly because I hadn't, I hadn't done that in a while. Right, I'd sort of moved away from that to a degree. Maybe it'd been four or five years uh, since I had really focused on that. So I hadn't really grown that at all. So I just picked up where I left off. It worked great for for this children's book, um, but if I were to you know pursue any of that further, I would probably want to take some more time and just you know develop the look to that type of work on my own more before I put it out there. Again. Oh, okay. Now, here's a question for you, just because you were mentioning it. Now, as far as, and I'm curious about this, as far as pitching to the New Yorker, uh, like the comics and stuff, what would you, uh, what's the process for that? What kind of, I guess, insight do you have into doing that sort of thing? I'm I'm just really curious about that as a cartoonist myself. (laughs) Not much, not much anymore. No? I mean, this was, this was 22 years ago. Yeah. Um, And so things, the way that, that all goes about, you know, I think has evolved a lot since then. I know that, uh, you know, the people that were running the departments have all turned over there. Um, and so, you know, generally speaking, if you're pitching to a magazine like the New Yorker, um, it takes, you know, uh, trying again and again and mm. again and again and getting no's or getting no responses, mm. um, you know, and, and it's to me, it's about having grit, right? And and being willing to get no's and then still be like, okay, you didn't like that one. I'm gonna try again. Right. I'm gonna try yeah. again. Yeah. Um, you know, for a little while I was, I mean, I was young and naive when I was uh at, you know, at out at the New Yorker. Not that I'm, you know, maybe I'm still a little bit naive in some ways, but I'm not young <laughs> anymore. Um and I thought when I got there, like, I'm going to, I'm going to pitch a cover to Francois Mouly. And so I oh. would do these, I would do these big paintings 
And I would just, I would, I would try to pitch them and she wouldn't give me the time of day. Um, but that's because I was just this illustration intern that was, you know, hanging out, going to get illustration materials and, and bringing them back for illustrators or whatever. Um, the, one of the best things I experienced with that though, was connecting with those other artists, oh, that's you know, a good point. Um, going and getting the materials and talking with them, you know, I, it's a great opportunity to sit down with David Levine, um, the, who, who has since passed away. He was one of the innovators of the sort of big head, little body, uh, political uh, mm. and social commentary uh, sort of illustrations. Um, he was also a um, a plein air watercolorist. He oh, would, really? Would paint. He would paint at the beach. Yeah. Hmm. So he was actually one of the guys who first opened my mind to the idea that it's not just one thing, right? Yeah, you, you know, you want to be great at the one thing and and push that one thing forward and succeed with it. But guess what? You can also paint watercolor paintings at the beach and have them not be part of who you are as a, you know, a world-class illustrator, right? And he would have a little show with these little watercolor paintings and nobody oh. would see them or, or fewer people would see them, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I got to that point in graduate school where I was sort of like, I'm almost finished with this illustration degree, but I'm not enjoying illustration. Right. This clicked in my mind. Oh, like, right. Just paint to paint. Mm -hmm. And, and that just, I mean, it just opened so many more doors in doing that. And, and knowing that there, you know, there might be one direction that you, sh you think you should be going, right? There might be one path that you think you should be treading. And, and that's the one. I got to do it. This is what I've said I'm going to do. But guess what? A little branch off that might be better, right? For a number of different reasons. And, and that conversation or the conversations that I had with Dave Levine about that stuff was, was really, uh, really mind expanding, hmm. right? in terms of what it means to be to be an artist to be a painter yeah right? no it's interesting how that all came together kind of like what you were saying in the beginning about the just the realization of like is this what i want to focus on or should are there other things that i could be focusing on yeah well and and, and it it's interesting because at the time of the conversation i didn't really believe him oh really Right. I was like, OK, yeah, because I, I wasn't impressed by his watercolor paintings. I should have been. Oh, really OK. Good. You know, I, because I was enthralled by his illustration. Mm. Like, OK, yeah, but they're not that like. Right. I gotcha. And so it was like, OK, well, I don't I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to. I heard you, but I'm not going to listen to that yet for some reason, whatever. Again, it's like 20 or something like that. Right. And not until I experienced it on my own did i hear his words and have them sort of resonate with me like oh well that's what he was talking about mm. oh right right and that insight and when i when i learned that in that moment where i was i was painting this painting it was a painting of peaches and cherries um when i realized it at that moment uh it just was relieving hmm. it's like oh right i can do this too and 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 it's fine if i do this too um and what that actually brought me beyond that is that as a, as a teacher now i realize that i can say something to somebody over and over and over and over and over again i can show somebody the thing over and over and over again and they're not going to understand it until they're ready to understand it. They're not going to mm -hmm. hear it until they're ready to hear it, right? Which gives me a little bit more patience in that process, right? Um, because obviously it's taken me time to learn the things that I, that, that, I, that I know or the new things that I continue to learn in painting. Um, and, you know, having that insight into, into the fact that it, it takes the human mind experiences to, mm -hmm. to sort of learn these things um, and having an experience myself, it really uh, helps me as a, as a teacher to be yeah. like, okay, 
Well, I'm going to tell you again, and you'll understand it yeah. when you understand it. No, there's, it, as you were saying that, there were at least three things that I thought of that are living rent free in my mind that stuck there forever that later on I was like, it made sense. It made me go, oh, that's what that person was talking about. And the funny thing is, is most of them, or most of them, two out of the three of them were ones that started out and they stood in my head because I was like, that person doesn't know what they're talking about. They're crazy. And then I figured out later. And the other one, I was like, I think what you just said is very smart, but I don't get it. You yeah. know, I don't understand how, the, and that's how the third one was where it's like, when it happened, it's like, oh, that's what they meant. You yeah. know, those, the, and that's very true. That's happened to me over the past uh, three, four years. There have been things yeah. where it's like, oh, okay, that's well, what I should, you know, when you're trying something new and you're like, why isn't this working or why don't right. I get this? And then all of a sudden it's right. like television where there's just an echoing voice in your head and it's like, oh, that's what that person meant. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that's ego, right? A lot of that's ego that gets in the way as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned about me anyway, I, I can't say for everybody, but for me anyway, it was a lot about ego that got in the way because when I started studying formally, I already knew a lot, right? And I already had a lot of developed technique, uh, control the medium. I already was drawing and painting representationally in a, an effective way. Um, I still had room to grow, but not until I was really truly willing to step aside of myself and and you know see the study for what it is, a study, um, even in the most simplistic uh, forms, was I able to sort of um, allow those types of points of uh, of advice in, right? Yeah. Because like you say there, you know, uh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. Right. Well, why do we think that? Because we think that we might know more than the person that's doing the talking. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we do, maybe we don't. But if we think that we don't, then we are, we're, we're more open to the, to the learning process regardless of whether we know more than the person teaching or the, te the teacher knows more than us. If we don't think that way, that there's a hierarchy involved, but rather just be a sponge, right? Mm -hmm. Take a humble approach and, and take in everything that we can, um, even at the most basic levels, that's when we really start to, to grow, right? Mm -hmm. Our knowledge, our ability, our understanding. It's like if we have these mental or what do you maybe even emotional roadblocks in place in trying to make paintings, we miss things, right? And it's really, really hard as a, a student or a painter who has experience, has knowledge, has had some successes to, to sort of, I guess, take down that wall that defines you, right? as a successful painter or take down that wall that defines the type of work that you do and be willing to grow. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, if you enter into any educational relationship, whether it's a formal education, that's a de degree track or a workshop or whatever, I think that's the most important thing that you can do is just strip yourself down to the, 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 the core of, of, of yourself and allow yourself to learn regardless of the level of the lesson, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's the simple lessons, because what I've found and what I, what I say a lot to students is that it's the fundamentals that make up the most complex things. If you can master the fundamentals, you're going to realize that those are the things that are going to be there for you when you need them in dealing with more complex issues. Mm -hmm. Now, Going from that, here's one more thing that I wanted to ask you. So that's all great advice as far as teaching. Now, what about, and learning, but what about uh, you do not only with the teaching and um, courses and things like that, and the painting that you do just to satisfy your artistic needs, but you also do portraits and you take commissions for those portraits. 
how do you go about doing that? How do you find people? Do you have a certain process for doing it? Like that's, that's an involved process. That's an involved subject. That's having somebody who on the other end is expecting a certain thing from you. That's tough for me. That's like, I have the same problem with tattoo artists. I'm like, that's too much pressure. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So how, first of all, how do you go about finding them? And how do you, what's the process of doing them? Uh, my commission work is generally word of mouth. Okay. All um, right. Yeah. And so, um, which is great. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't take out ads in magazines. I, I don't do a, a ton of commissions a year, but I do enough. Right. Yeah. Um, people that I've known will hire me as a, a painter to commission work. Um, people that know people that I know will, will hire, um, one recent commission came through um, the great people at Monroe Street Arts, right? So hmm. um, that word of mouth thing, really sort of building community, I think is um, an important part of it, right? Um, when it comes to uh, the commission painting process, it's really interesting because it is, it's similar to the illustration process, right? Hmm. But the difference is, is that you're not working with an art director. You're working with somebody who has a, a an idea in their mind about what they want a painting to be. Yes. And a lot of the times that idea is emotionally charged, right? When somebody wants to commission something like a, a commission landscape, for example, um, there's a point that, you know, somebody wants to be at uh, or somebody experienced at, at this location and they want that to exist in a painting. Well, there's a real difficulty there, right? Because, I wasn't present at that point. So I've got to go put myself in that location and try to find the moment or a moment similar to the one that they're trying to, to describe, right? And so landscape commissions are, are really interesting because I'll go to the location over and over and over at different times a day, shooting different, uh, you know, different references and then sharing those references with um, the, you know, the client that's commissioning the painting. And then they'll say, yes, that that strikes the key or, well, it's not quite there, right? Whatever. So we'll keep trying. Okay. Um, and uh, generally speaking, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at, at understanding after a couple of tries what they're after and, and we can move forward positively from there. And then the painting itself, that process, um, you know, start to finish takes me X amount of time, depend, depending on size and, and complexity. Um, but then the presentation of the finished work is always one of those opportunities where it's like, okay, well, um, you know, tell me if this is working for you. And I, I guess more often than not, actually, almost all the time, it's, it's the, the you know, the client's like, wow, you, you nailed it, you know? Um, okay. But that, that base is, ha that's based heavily on that uh, initial process of, you know, talking to the person about time of day, time of, year, these types of things, going mm -hmm. to location, shooting a bunch of references and sharing those with the person commissioning. Now, portrait painting is a little different, um, uh, it, but it's similar too, right? So I'll go shoot a bunch of references. Um, uh, so I did a, a commission painting of a judge up in Northern Wisconsin. It was the most recent portrait commission that I did. Yeah, I saw that one. Yeah, yeah. It was really a, a fun painting to do. Oh, okay. Um, and I went and shot probably uh, 150 different images, right? Through the course wow. of a couple of hours, different locations in the courthouse, different poses, different ideas, different lighting, all this stuff, right? Um, and we settled on, oh, I settled on, a, a, I think, three of them that I thought were really good compositionally with regards to lighting, with regards to pose, sent them off. And then we agreed on one of them. And so then I started into it and, um, you know, I, uh, I, I do a good likeness in drawing, and so that wasn't really an issue. But with this particular painting, I had taken it to a level of finish that I knew probably needed to go a little bit further, but I liked a lot of the like mark making and brushwork that was happening yeah. in the stage where it was like almost done. And so I said, I'm, I said it's done. I'm going to leave it, right? Okay. And uh, but you know, my better judgment should have told me, yeah, you need to take it into that final refinement. Um, because of course, then they, they got the, the portrait like, well, maybe, 
maybe you could do X, Y, and Z. And all the things that they picked out that, that they, uh, they didn't like about the portrait were things that would have been initially resolved in one more pass, mm. right? one more refinement pass. Okay. And so of course I took it back, did the refinement to it, delivered it and they loved it. Right. Um, but it's, you know, in, in that case, it was sort of a matter of me being enthralled by the paint application that stopped me from what uh, <laughs> okay. um, and and so there's a fine line there right between like okay uh painter as sort of um you know experimenter right uh painter as uh you know this uh this, this idea of, of making something and it's intriguing to you versus delivering a product right delivering a product to somebody that is that is what they're expecting and so commission painting is very much in my mind, delivering a product that is what they're expecting. And if, yeah. if they're not satisfied, then let's work to get it to, to where, to where they are. Um, so yeah, portrait painting is, is, is interesting because people look at a painting of themselves and they say, do I look, do I look that old or <laughs> right? Exactly. Is that really what I really, like, that's yeah, why that's I don't like to do characters. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just feel like, every, yeah, I've never had anybody look at a character and go, hey, that's totally me. Although I don't think most people do when they see Probably a character. Not, right? yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, ideally, ideally with portrait painting for me, I get to paint from direct observation initially, but it seems like that's not, for me anyway, the case uh, for, for commission work. If, if I could get somebody to sit for me for, you know, three, four hours at a clip and, right. and do direct observational portrait painting for a commission better, but, um, you know, you're asking a lot of somebody to give you that much, that much time mm -hmm. where, you know, digital photography is, is just about as effective. Nothing replaces the direct observational experience. Yeah. And when you're painting somebody from direct observation, the interstitial space is full of the person you're painting, right? It's not just it's not just what they look like. It's everything that surrounds them that you can also feel when you're making a painting, Yeah, which you don't necessarily get when you're doing a painting from a photo reference. Um, so to a degree, I think painting from the photo, painting a commissioned portrait from a photo reference is a bit of a shortcut, mm -hmm. um, a contemporary shortcut. Uh, and it is really more ideal to spend time in the space and, and paint the person as they're sitting there. The way that I tend to, I guess, compensate for that is I'll sit and talk to the person. The whole time we're shooting references, I'll talk to the person, try to get their demeanor, try to hear their voice, try to get some insight into who they are beyond just the, you know, in this case, the, the judicial robe and the books, right? Yeah. Um, and that helps me a lot because then I can put that person that I met or that I got to know into my mind as I make, as I'm making the painting from the reference. It's, it, it's sort of like a, a hack to a degree of mm -hmm. a direct observational portrait painting, which would be the ideal. Okay. You know? And if yeah. people, well, first of all, do you have any uh, projects or galleries or any sort of things coming up that you'd like people to know about? Um, I am. Uh, well, I've, I've got a, uh, two classes that I'm teaching at Monroe Street Arts that are coming up, a, a, a painting class, uh, I'm sorry, a drawing class first, and then a painting class, both are six weeks. Okay. Starting up in March. Um, and they'll, then the next one, I think, begins sometime in mid to late April. Um, and so, yeah, that that's something that people can go sign up for if they want to spend some time learning um, from themselves and from me. Um, and then I'm, uh, I've got two big paintings, um, uh, big commission paintings uh, that are sort of wrapping up right now. Um, I'm in my my home studio, but these paintings are are bigger than I can accommodate here. So oh. um, I have a temporary space um, uh, up at a friend's studio um, where I can have both pieces, um, you know, out on display and 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 interchange them and step back from them. Um, and those will hang in. Um, the atrium area of Sardine, the restaurant in town. Hmm. Um, okay. They'll, they'll hang there. And um, I bet the time frame for them hanging there will be something like late March. Okay. Which will be fun. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, and then I, I participate in shows with American Feral Gallery in the spring and the fall. Um, I was showing with galleries out west, um, but I wasn't having a lot of financial success. So I was spending more, right. not spending more than I was making. I, yeah. was, I, was, I was shipping a lot. I felt like it was just a little bit wasteful um, in terms of materials and resources and, and time spent. Um, and a lot of that, you know, it, galleries are great. I, th I think we have to have galleries. Galleries are, are, they help to legitimize painting, right? On so many little bricks and mortar galleries because they know what they're talking about. You know, you can open Instagram or whatever social media app you're on. You can see, you know, thousands of paintings a day if you want to. And there's no one there to legitimize them unless you see them maybe through a gallery site, right? So, you know, bricks and mortar galleries, I think, are are a necessity in the art world. Um, I moved away from them and have become a little bit more intrigued by just the idea of making commissions. Um, I think primarily because uh, I felt a little bit like I was making too much, right? Like, like you know, this idea, this, the time and the space we live in, for me anyway, I don't want to necessarily put more stuff, more materials in, into the world unless I feel like they need to be there. Okay. Right? Um, so just painting big paintings just to paint them or painting paintings just to paint them was awesome for learning and for education and for growing. And um, and I still have more learning and growing to do, no doubt about it, as a painter. Um, but I've slowed down that practice of just painting to paint. And a lot of what I do now, I want to have a home, right? I want to have an intention. Why am I painting this? Not just because I like the image, but where will it live, right? Um, where will it be? Or, I mean, and who knows, after it goes out of my hands, where that ends up. But what it's not going to do is be in a stack of paintings that sits in my studio storage space, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because it has intention, because it has direction. Um, now, it, painting for gallery shows gives me some of that. But there's still that open-ended question, like, okay, goes to the gallery, but does it sell? Yeah. Uh, you know, 50-50, right? Um, whereas a commission work has intention, has a home, um, you're making something for somebody that they're interested in already. Um, and so that's become my my bigger focus than, you know, like what you say, you know, gallery shows coming up. Not much, mainly because of of wanting to make things that have a home. Okay. Now, if people wanted to check out some of these things and maybe look at this, I'm doing a segue, maybe wanted to have them in their home. <laughs> yeah. Where could yeah. they go find some of your work or see what, what you do? Well, jessemangerson.com is probably the best spot to go. You can see the work online. Um, as far as stuff seen locally, like the American Feral uh, Gallery Project, um, they can come to that in, uh, it's twice a year. Um, and I usually paint specifically for those shows. Um, new work there. Um, they can pop into Sardine and see the commission works that'll be up there. Um, there's already, they've they actually already have two in the space. Um, and so they can see that work there. Um, but as far as, you know, gallery spaces, no, you, you're not going to find them. Uh, you're not going to find them locally. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for talking with me today. This has been great. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it.